Crystal Deal With It focuses on bridging the gap between where you're at now and where you'd like to be. We'll explore wisdom and techniques from a wide variety of domains and industries and apply them to your unique challenges. I love developing frameworks, processes, and storytelling metaphors that enable personal and business growth. Through actionable next steps, we'll build momentum and confidence. My goal is to help you clear roadblocks, do more with what you have, and realize the potential of yourself and your team. So throw your challenges my way, and Chris will deal with it. Welcome to Chris will deal with it. On this episode, I have a very special guest, the one and only Jack Para. Hello. How are you doing? Jack, I've had the pleasure of working with on four projects in the book realm, and then one game project never saw the light of day. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> I still occasionally hang it at art shows. I did last year. Oh, did you? <laughs> what we're going to do today, so Jack was very instrumental in helping me create the world of the Rainy River Bees. Um, he also did the cover for my book that was released last year called Rosicky's Navy, which was just cover art. But with the Bees books, it was very much about creating these different alien species and... I had some ideas going in about what I wanted, but actually through the process of working with Jack, and I'd worked with him in the games beforehand, really helped inform a lot of what I ended up writing. So I thought it'd be cool to kind of do a bit of a retrospective now that the books are about six years old and just... Oh, wow. Yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll start with a more general question to get into, into this here, but what's uh -huh. it like working with me? Oh, really easy. Well, <laughs> um, some of what I like to get into is like how to actually work with artists and things like that. So I try to make it easy, but I'd love you to actually explain that more. Oh, it's very easy. My ideal way to work is from from a script or a blurb, and Chris is always has plenty of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just really easy to go back and forth with him. I just will, I'll do a sketch, show him. He'll tell me what he's looking for, and I'll go with his ideas and what I think will add to it or what I think works or doesn't work. You're very easygoing about that, like, does this work? Does this not visually work across? Things like that you're very easy to go back and forth with and very responsive when I send emails. And, and the video chats just make it real easy. Yeah. I mean, we've had some video chats. Like, I think it was for, uh, I think it was for sure. cover number two. Yeah, the like like I sent a sketch and you weren't really into it. We did a video chat and I think I did on Photoshop right then while yep. we were talking the like the, what you exactly liked and became the cover. Yeah, exactly. I knew the visual in my mind of what I wanted, mm -hmm. but how to execute on was a problem. And you actually really formed that that top down kind of um, perspective with the ship. Yeah, well, I, uh, oh, perspective. I love and hate. <laughs> I love and hate it. <laughs> no, I know. So you say I'm easy to work with, but then I know we got off camera, off the phone. You had to be cursing my name on some of the perspective art. <laughs> no, I'm cursing my own name on the perspective art because I chose it. <laughs> that's true. I think that in book three was the hockey store. That was that was. Oh, that's my favorite piece. Know, but it was it was. I'm really good at perspective one one point through three point. When it gets past that, I start to struggle. Yeah. But that's what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> and the hockey hive piece. For a six, not six inch by nine inch piece in a book, I think I was yeah. working 13 by 19 to get yep. that perspective right. So let's talk about that piece a little bit more. I think that would be really good for the audience. So in my mind, I mean, that was a very detailed scene. So for those who haven't read the book yet, it's very much about army of newly empowered rats. Uh, I won't get into the whole story of why they're there, but they are there to challenge the beast to a hockey game in a hockey store. So they clear the racks out of the window of the store and legitimately play hockey in a hockey store, which is probably a fantasy for every kid that's ever been in a hockey store. But I, I knew how the store needed to be laid out, and I actually gave you a two-dimensional architectural drawing of the store. Oh, that helped so much. Because, that's, <laughs> because the store is actually owned by two of the kids from the, fir from the first book, and so I needed to have a lot of backstory to that. Unlike the first book where you know I could tweak how I wrote the aliens because they didn't show up in as many scenes. And here I wasn't going to rewrite four or five chapters. So I wanted to be very sure of how the story was laid out. But then how, like, where you took that? Like, how did you take my two-dimensional drawing but also make it your own? Well, I mean, I always do thumbnails of everything. And one of the things I take into account most often with stuff like that is what characters got to fit where in the scene. And it seems like from book one to three, the number of characters in those small little drawings kept getting more and more and more. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and I'm like, how do I fit an entire 
humans and aliens hockey team and an entire team of rats in one little vertical yeah, <laughs> vertical <laughs> tube. vertical <laughs> six by nine piece and that's where the curvilinear perspective came yeah. in on that one because i pretty much just like all right i gotta get into visual distortion in this one to to get yeah. it right and i love visual distortion so it's just not always easy to achieve but <laughs> no, I think that was uh, we worked together obviously on Fire at Will, which should have a yeah. unique perspective for, it. and that was going to be a card game box cover. Um, so I had I, I already I mean you were so easy to work with in that project, even though it didn't come through. You were, we became friends through that project, through project yeah. and through the first book, I knew you you were the guy I wanted to work with on it. But I starting to see your love of doing unique perspectives really opened my mind to what was possible. Like especially in the second and third books, really starting to write scenes with a crazy perspective in mind, oh, right? God. There was a game in the pyramid. <laughs> oh, so it is partially your fault. <laughs> well, 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 partially your fault too, right? Because knowing that you were so into perspective, I'm, I almost, because you kind of write with that perspective too. You, you have to be someone omniscient and know what's going to happen in your story. You have to see it up above like you're watching a hockey game. But yeah. even in the non-hockey scenes, the one, I, the one of my favorite pieces that we worked on together was in the second book where um, they go down into... Um, they're solving the puzzle with the six statues, and it's very much a my homage to the Fifth Element, uh, the scene where she has to go in there. And Lilu has to save the Earth, but they have, to, they have to solve the four <laughs> posts and the four problems. I'm not trying to throw a bunch of spoilers in here. Like I can edit them out. You know, knowing that it was very much like a top down how it would look, but from the I had to write it from the character's perspective, but I could visualize. All right, I think Jack's gonna have a lot of fun with this scene before I actually wrote it. That was the one with all the little statues. Yeah, each one had a unique challenge. And oh, that was rough. Because <laughs> it had to be so tiny too, right? It had to be really tiny. I had six, six things that had to be shown, and they were in the round. They yep. were all around each other. <laughs> So I had to somehow show things from the back, but still make them look good. <laughs> well, you pull, I mean, pull it off every time. And, Thank and, you. And part of the, and I love to you to answer this question for the audience, but. You know, part of the problem with a, a printed book, right, is you have two colors, right? You're talking about black and white line art. You can get full color printing, but these books would not be affordable at that point, no, not especially at all. when they're self published. But can you talk more about how you work through the process of, because you're, you're an amazing visual artist as well. You're a painter, you have incredibly detailed, full, full scale artwork. Working with black and white. It's actually pretty easy for me to make that transition because I have a few styles. I have, uh, I have cartoony, and I have uh, more of a, a comic book type cartoony, and then I have really render realistic. Yeah. And I like working both a lot. And then yours, being younger, went a little more cartoony than I usually go with, uh, with the line art, which was fun. But so I'm really practiced in, in line art and black and white, and I, I love the, I still ink everything by hand because I just get, well, I'm way faster at it, oddly enough. Um, but also, I just love the getting just a nicely rendered line with a with a flick of the brush. And it's funny you say that because I, I one of the things I've always admired about your artwork is those natural lines, right? I one of my proudest pieces I have in my office is the one from the first book with Chris and then the Sabik that you drew for. No. That, and that was one of the ones where I gave you two pages. Yeah. But uh, so you really get that cool yeah. perspective. No, the but, the one with the really ridiculous foreshortening. Yeah, <laughs> I, I love it. But it's it's knowing that if you look at the covers of the books, they're very much digital in color. Yeah. But knowing that they have that authentic hand touch to the to the line work, is a really cool mix. Because again, you're you're a fantastic digital artist as well. Can you talk a little bit more about so taking that line the, the line art that you draw, but also incorporating digital elements because there's quite a bit of it throughout the books. My uh, first use in Photoshop really was uh, trying to get in the comics world as a digital colorist. And because of that, I adapt my style to any the different intricacies of, of the artist I'm coloring. And I just found the, wor the world is just too... It's terrible to get into. It's a t <laughs> unless you become... Unless you get in one of the mainstream yeah. publishers on a big book, you, it's just a horrible field... Not bad, but like working hard, for dollars an hour. Hard on, hard on the artist. Yeah. Um, if that, like a lot of the indie publishers refuse to pay because they don't have to. I've actually had indie publishers say that to me directly. What? Yeah, I know. I'm like, I'm done. But it's given me 
the skills I need to color line art in Photoshop real well. I want to take a quick pause just to add a little note here that Jack doesn't think that all indie publishers are like that. He has met a lot of great ones too. At the time that he's talking about, he was really trying to break into the industry. The cons were really flooded with that type of publisher that was trying to take advantage. And then like I took that into digital painting and now like, I have a little of both. Like I like yeah. the first one was just straight line art with color. Very, very comic book approach. Yep. The second one was very painterly, and I actually didn't do ink on that one. I just did pencil. Well, that's that's right. That's, I that's <laughs> for, been, for it's been that long now. I'm like, yeah, I remember you're talking about softer it. feel. Yeah. And then uh, the third one, I did ink wash, ink line and wash, and digitally colored over that, and I like that effect too. Yeah. It's just like I, but they all have like, I feel like I guess the color palette really brings them together. That was, and, and ties I, them together. You know, when I wrote the first book, that was it wasn't a trilogy in my mind, right? And knowing I could do more with the world, like I had ideas of where I could maybe take that. But then, I know when we started talking about the third book. It was very much like a revenge story. So, I know we talked about the clouds around it. I wanted there to be some kind of visual tie-in. Um, that's also when I think we decided to wrap the art around the spine of the book as well. So I redid, oh, I redid but, the yeah. first book to do that. And yet, I think I had to, uh, you had to expand the artwork on the first book to accommodate that. But the third book was very much about having a cohesive look. The books look like they're together. But you're right, there is a very distinct mix of styles between them. Yeah, I mean, they all have my hand in them, but they yeah. all look different at the same point. Yeah, but they, they, they go together. Yeah. But. And just in general, like, my line art on the third cover is so much better than my line art on the first book. But that's just time and practice, you know? Yeah, and, and you know, I, I do, and part of this challenge, especially with the first book, was like, you're not a hockey player. No. You didn't really grow up around the game, but I know there were certain elements, like, I was a, I was a real, probably a pain in your ass, because this is the way a hockey stick looks like curves. I take oh, yeah. actual photos and stuff. I know you work a lot of photo reference and things, too, but it's kind of going through, how do I stay true to the game, but also inform, yeah, that, that, that not was, hurt your style. That was tough, because... Um, it took a while for me to get it, and then I got it, and then you add odd pers crazy perspectives onto it, too. <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> and I eventually went to, like, a sporting goods store and just looked at one, but and took a couple pics, but not nearly as many as I should have. <laughs> I should have taken, like, videos of it from every angle. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in college, I played, like, some pickup games of street hockey, but that's that's about the extent of it. I, I never even owned a stick, you know? But yeah. You know, so well, I think we were, t we were talking about even you know there were changes that I made to the game yeah. too, right? So yeah. I wanted to make it you know a sci-fi story too. So I was throwing quite a few curveballs your way. No, I mean I I I'm not as nearly as into sports as I was when I was younger. But I I you know I used to be a big baseball and basketball fan, and, you know. So I have the general idea of it, but it's like the particulars of that. Well, was there anything unique you did? So I know you part of what you do, you do a lot of um, like art role playing game art book artwork and things mm -hmm. like that. Where you're talking about wielding swords, and mm -hmm. obviously there's certain physical motions that come with that. Displaying characters, hockey's got a lot of similarities too in terms of it being a physical sport. Did you approach drawing hockey players any differently than let's say a uh, sword wielding maniac? Uh, oddly, no. <laughs> but maybe talk just a there's bit about actually, the process. They're actually pretty similar when it comes down to it because. Um, it's just really like instead of a weapon, it's a hockey stick, and like how is it held? Like on the first cover, the the sticks are held like weapons. But yeah. That's not how you hold them playing. Yeah, that's so true. So that that yeah. was a that those hand positions are a little bit to learn. But as far as like the padding and stuff, once I understood the padding for for hockey, it's just like a different type of armor, you know. And I you know I can draw f full plate armor out of my head at this point. <laughs> So. Did, did, did you start from like a skeletal structure and then add like a musculature and then add the pads? What's your approach generally? My, my approach for everything, after after I decide the, after I do thumbnails and decide the the pose and everything, for everything I do a, a mannequin style underdrawing, of the, with mostly just like curved lines and cylinders, and shapes like that to represent the body parts. And then I do full anatomy on top of that, and then I do clothing on top of that. And, that was and, and I, I do that for every single person I draw ever. One thing I've seen, and maybe I'm, I'm shortening this too much, and you can correct me where I'm wrong here, 
But through your process from the first book, and I know you did a commission for my daughter's last Christmas, and what you did, you know, when you first did the thumbnails, you really got into the characters a lot before I even got a look at it. I think now, you know, you gave me those wireframes, those real general, like, let's get the pose right before I start building all those extra yeah. elements to shorten up your own process, too. Have you feel like you've, like, has that process, am I, am I right in saying you've kind of found techniques or tools to help you save time on that initial stage? Yes, and, and also having worked with you a bunch, I know that you can understand some of the more scratchier stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because true. I tend to get so complicated in the way that I build figures. It can get a little cumbersome in the beginning part to do all that for something that might just be thrown out as like not the right pose or not the right composition or you know. So yeah. I, I think I've gotten better at streamlining that. It, it brings up a good point. So I grew up drawing. I grew up doing did some digital artwork. I I did all the graphic design on the books. You know, I pride myself on having a good eye for art. I don't have the talent you do. I, I haven't put in anywhere near the hours to draw as incredibly as you do you know it's not about who's better who's worse I, I just came out of I did have a background in graphic art to understand what I what I wanted and I had some vernacular but not just me but other people that might hire you as an artist are there things that you wish they had a better grasp of yeah just like visual understanding I've had trouble with people I'm working with I do different things in different stages and the one thing I always want approval on since I ink by hand is I want approval before I go to inks. Yeah. Because, that was always a big thing. Because yeah. it's m much easier to change the pencils around than once you go to ink, yeah, I can use correction fluid and stuff like that and, and, and adjust things. But if it's a big change, that correction fluid gets really chunky and it, and it makes it very difficult to re... What's a brush stroke on a plain piece mm. of paper becomes a real pain in... A real pain on over like this correction stuff. And there were some of your pens and some of your pencils when you were giving me for approval. Like I know that for the first book, there was a point I think I even asked you, like, um, can we just stick with the pencils? This is incredible. Like, um, yeah, I mean, pencil is, was my original primary medium, so I tend to be a bit ahead of everything else with it. Yeah. Um, so like, I, it's almost like when you put ink on it, like I know how good it's going to come out, but it's like I don't want to well, ruin this it's piece. A it's a different way of thinking too. Yeah. How, okay, um, can you dig into that more? Yeah, um, like when with pencil you have you have the whole variation of values. Just you can get them all with just one pencil. Although I use a couple to make it easier. Yeah. But um, the H's and the B's. The H's and the B's. Uh, I'll put a link to it uh, just to like, help the audience understand yeah. that. But with ink line, you're starting with your darkest dark and your lightest light. So getting the in-betweens can be tough, and it's a, it's a way of learning, like, how much you, you have to do with feathering or hatching, how a broken line makes it look more like a highlight than a, than a shadow, hmm. like just having, like, just a break in the line, you know? It's thin line with, with spaces in it, you know? It's it, how much that can do towards the light end. And here's why that, that's a beak art I like so much, because yeah. you had the fur and everything, too. The, the, the oh, fur, yeah. fur and hair. Broken lines are everything on them. Yeah. Unless, unless you're like a very distinct like Akira Toriyama type style. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Banana hair and all that. So you just got to learn how to use broken lines and hatching and feathering. And which feathering I suck at. Uh, but <laughs> your, your suck is my like mastery. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how to learn to use the viewer's visual way of seeing to fill in the blanks like sometimes it's a, a dark and a light and you know the the, the viewer is going to see that in between so you don't have to do it yeah like, like you, the, the, your, yeah your viewer will fill in the blanks for you and knowing where they can fill in the blanks and, and there's a lot of training that goes into that too i know you so you went to school for fine arts and your yeah. coursework isn't always just here's how to draw i mean there's a lot that goes into it right i, mean, yeah, I remember yeah, you showed me work from your um anatomy classes oh, but can you yeah. talk more about some of the different types of skills that really helped oh, yeah. you become well, a better yeah. artist so i went i went to four-year college and then i've taken like individual classes afterwards i've actually learned way more in the individual classes afterwards like, with a few exceptions like color color theory in, in college was like some of the best classes i ever yeah. took they they offered two and i took it four times <laughs> <laughs> literally yeah, no, that's, that's awesome um, but uh, anatomy, oh, my anatomy teacher. You learn to draw the skeleton. You learn to draw the muscles on top of the skeleton. But not only that, as he lectures in the class, 
he lectures as to what each muscle does, why it's there, why, you know, how all mu almost all muscles on moving body parts are contrary, where, like, there's one that moves it one way, one that moves it the other way. And it's just, like, learning all that and, like, it was a full year, yeah. two-semester course. First year was just, just the head. Second year was the whole body. And we drew the skeleton in its completion. He and showed me we, this, yeah. And then we did acetate overlays, and we drew the muscles on top attached to the skeletal points. The amount of hours. It was, oh, it's was incredible. Awesome. Those, those courses are so hard to find, but when you find one, my teacher at the Ducre School of Art in Plainfield, New Jersey. Yeah, plug him. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes Frank, as well. Frank Falatik. Yeah, he's just an amazing teacher. He was a medic in the Navy, and um, so he learned the act like he yeah. actually learned how to medically fix people. That's a, yeah, I was like, that's like, that's like <laughs> what, all, what you went through is almost like pre med. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he that's basically what he almost did, but. Uh, well, <laughs> I want to, if you don't mind, change the tag a little. I want to play off that a little bit more. Where when you're paying a, a professional artist, you're not just paying for the piece that you're contracted for. Their rates are based on the fact that there's been, in many cases, decades of passion and hard work and difficult courses yeah. like that to do it in a time frame that makes sense or to do it at a level yeah. where you're doing a crazy yeah. 17 point perspective. One of my favorite little comic memes that I've seen on Facebook in the last few years is. Uh, a, g a guy comes up to his boss and you know he's like and showing him like what he did for a project he requested and, and the guy's like oh you did that on five minutes what are I paying you all this for he's like well you're paying for the the yep. the, the 25 years and th thousands and thousands of dollars in schooling that got me to the point where I could yeah do exactly. this in five minutes it, no exactly <laughs> I, I think all too often we've become as maybe as a society and I won't get too grandiose about this I'm going somewhere with this but is people just, they see time as a number. Oh, $100 an hour? Great. Um, but there's so much more that goes into this. I mean, and, and there is a handbook, and I'll link to it in the show notes. Um, uh, Graphic Artist Skills Pricing and Ethical Guidelines. Yeah, it's a great starting point, not just for the artist, but also people that might need to work with artists that really understand what is a fair market rate. And that mar there's a lot of variation within yeah. there based on your notoriety, your yeah. skill level, they, what you're trying to do. They put it out every four or five years, and it literally is that. What they do is they interview people in the field yep. and what they're charging and what they're making, and they publish it. Yeah. And they do it for pretty much every visual arts field is in there. If you don't mind being a bit vulnerable here, it's, a, it's still a difficult life to have to draw and have to find clients, yeah. but also find that. What's your biggest challenge as, a, as your own business? In, in making a living being an artist? In the modern age, yeah. everything's, you're seeing the dawn of AI art now, and everyone oh. thinks that art's cheap. I'd love to get your perspective on where you see your challenges both now and going forward. Well, one of the challenges in which AI art is actually really hurting is value. The value of, you know, being able to charge what they, people think, you know, you're worth and people not understanding that you're not AI. You're not a computer? Yeah. You and, have to that, eat? and that for the most part, especially now, AI art is using samples of artists who spent their whole lives creating that style. And you put that person's name in and they take it. And that should be copyright infringement. Yeah. And I think there's an ongoing legal battle here. I mean, I saw someone... I was actually very disappointed in DeviantArt. DeviantArt started their own AI. Did they really? Yep, just recently. Oof. And originally, the sampling was everyone's art on DA. And then after an outcry, they put a little checkbox that you could you could check that you're not interested in being part of the sample. And then after more outcry, they auto-checked that box. <laughs> so they, had, they had to have they the They had to outcry. go through three outcries to put it the way it should have started. Yeah, because they run it like a business. They don't, it's, and that's where you, that's the danger of platforms to some extent, right? Yeah, if I'm you're, really disappointed in the DA. They used to be all, all pro artist rights, yeah, but and now there's, they seem to be losing that. But at the same time, like how you get discovered as an artist are through these platforms, but the platforms are just exploiting you to serve their other business needs yeah. or their shareholders' investments and to sell it to AI art. Yeah. And it's not just like random up-and-comers that use DeviantArt. Professional comic artists are huge on yeah. DeviantArt. I have friends who, who work for Marvel and DC who have since deleted their DeviantArt accounts because yeah. of this. And think of all the hours and time <coughs> and, and business yeah. that came because of being on those platforms is now gone. Yeah. So... You know, and relationships and having, you know, again, our friendship extends beyond the art that we've, that, that you've produced for, for my work. 
But at the same time, I mean, how important have partnerships been long term in your own career outside of art, what we've done? Oh, they're good. I like working with repeat uh, customers. I have a few others that I work with. I got a contact against the other day. But I like repeat business because you know how you're working with them. You know that they'll like what you do and what they're looking for out of you. Yeah, and they understand your process. Yeah, they understand your process. What do you think right now today is your biggest, aside from what we just talked about, your biggest challenge? Uh, currently, it's the, the pandemic really hit a, put a hit on me because I got a lot of my clients through conventions and them just now starting to pick back up again. Like, that's how I'll get my, my work again, but I'm kind of behind now. Like, just before the pandemic, I was turning down jobs yeah. <laughs> because, because of scheduling. Yeah, yeah, I think I remember the thing, yeah. the second book, like, when, how are we going to fit this artwork around your other... And I've learned I'm not really not good at handling more than one large job at a time. Like, a single piece, second client is one thing, but multiple pieces for multiple clients is just kills my schedules. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, it's, 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 it's a good source it, of income good. as well, right? It's a yeah. bigger project. So. And getting clients to understand that arbitrary deadlines are unnecessary. Like, I've had a lot of, I've had to turn down jobs because clients wanted things at a specific time yeah. that meant nothing. Like, a random deadline they pulled out, or they want to be ready for a convention. Like or starting the process too late, right? Starting too, the process too late and wanting to be ready for a convention. And I'm like, yeah, I know you want your piece ready for a convention, but everyone in the field that I do a lot of artwork wants their pieces yeah. ready for that same convention. So you got to kind of... Yeah, space it, it out. One of my other clients just he's like, you, I publish when I'm ready. You know, and, when it's ready. You know, we'll we'll prepare for the the conventions that happen after it's ready. Yeah, I remember pushing yeah. back pushing back the release, especially book two, because there was a lot of artwork in that yeah. book. We and it was the biggest of the of the trilogy, but also because we wanted to get it right. Working with your demands, like I didn't want you to rush through the art. I didn't want you to just you know. Yeah, there was there's a th- uh, feel some arbitrary deadline when I was self publishing it to begin with. Yeah, I, for some stupid reason, I decided to do all the drawings, then all the inking on that. I've never done that again, <laughs> because by the end of that, yeah, I had to push. We had to push it back a couple of days because my eyes were just starting to hurt from staring at the ink lines. I just like, yeah, mental note: do a few, finish a few; do a few, yep. finish a few. Don't do all the pencils, then expect. Well, because then I got all, then I got all yeah. the art like one in like big packs. Yeah, I had yeah, to do all the processing and stuff yeah. too, but. Well, listen, yeah, I, I'd love I learned, to... I learned that the hard way. <laughs> I would love to dig into this more on a future episode. Jack, it's just, you know, we're here at PhilCon in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Great opportunity just to face-to-face have a conversation, but I know it won't be the last. No, so, I'm, thanks I'm for being sorry. on the show. Glad to be at a con again. <laughs> if you feel that Chris dealt with it, I'd appreciate your support of the show by sharing it with someone who might benefit. Ratings on your favorite podcast player are also helpful in growing the audience. Visit chriscroyder.com for free downloadable PDFs with notes and resources from today's episode, sign up for the CDWI mailing list, or to send in your problems or requests for future shows. That's C-H-R-I-S-K-R-E-U-T-E-R.com, or use the link in the show notes. Thanks for listening to Chris will Deal With It.